This is a honors level calculus lecture on Taylor's formula. The simplest functions in calculus are the constant function sending real x's to 1, the identity function sending real x's to x itself, and pointwise products of these, which are the power functions, where x is sent to x squared, x is sent to x cubed, and so on, and also the linear combinations, which are called polynomials. So polynomial p is a function from r to r, which is a linear combination of the power functions. So there exist fixed numbers c0 to cd in r, such that px is given by c0 times 1 plus c1 times x plus c2 times x squared plus so on up to cd times xt, where x is in r. And these fixed numbers c0 to cd are called the coefficients of this polynomial. And if cd is not equal to 0, then we say that the degree of this polynomial p is d. So suppose that we are given a d degree polynomial, then it turns out that there's a special relationship between the coefficients ck's of this polynomial and the successive derivatives of p at 0. So the pk0 for k equal to 0 to d. So let's see what this relationship is. So if our polynomial is c0 plus c1x plus so on up till cd xt, then if we simply put x equal to 0, we see that p0 is equal to c0. So the zeroth coefficient is nothing but the polynomial evaluated at 0. On the other hand, if we differentiate this polynomial, then we get the constant term c1 plus terms containing x. And again, if we put x equal to 0, we see that c1 is equal to p prime at 0. And if we continue this process and we take the second derivative of p at x, we get this constant term 2c2 plus terms containing x. And then if we put x equal to 0, we get p double prime at 0 is 2c2. And continuing in this manner, inductively, it can sh be shown that the kth derivative of p at x has, has the constant term k factorial ck plus terms containing x. And again, if we put x equal to 0, we see that the kth derivative of p at 0 is k factorial times ck. And we can continue this process and consider the dth derivative of p at uh, x, which gives which is just the constant function d factorial times cd. And so again, if we put x equal to 0, we see that the dth derivative of p at 0 is d factorial times cd. And if we differentiate furthermore, then we start getting zeros. So summarizing, we have seen that for a d degree polynomial p, its coefficients are related to its successive derivatives at 0 in this manner. The ckth coefficient is the kth derivative of p at 0 divided by k factorial and this is true for all k's in between 0 and d. So this is a story with polynomials but now suppose that instead of a polynomial p we start with a smooth function f from r to r and how smooth do we take f to be? Well when we state precisely Taylor's formula we will um, uh, specify this, but right now let's just take f to be infinitely many times differentiable. So we have a smooth function, but there is no polynomial in sight. But now suppose that we construct a d-degree polynomial p, which is related to our given smooth function f like this. So px is defined by f at 0 plus f prime 0 by 1 factorial times x plus so on up till the dth derivative of f at 0 by d factorial times xd, where x is an r. So we notice several things about this p. First of all, p is a polynomial of degree at most d. And this p is related to f. After all, the coefficients of this p are obtained from the successive derivatives of f at 0. But now that this p is a polynomial, we knew that for polynomials, its coefficients were related to its successive derivatives at 0 in this manner. So for this particular polynomial, we know that the kth derivative of this polynomial at 0 by k factorial must be its kth coefficient, which is nothing but the kth derivative of f at 0 by k factorial. And this is true for all k's in between 0 and d. So this k factorial cancels on both sides. And what we have got about this specially constructed p from the given smooth f is that the kth derivative of p at 0 matches exactly with the kth derivative of f at 0 for all k's in between 0 and d. So this p matches very well with f. So if our given function was like this with the dark blue 
uh, line and our constructed P, the polynomial, is indicated by this light blue line, then what we know is about this polynomial P is that its value at 0 matches with the value of f at 0. Also, the slope of the tangent line to the graph of P at 0 matches with the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at 0. And not only that, this continues all the way to the dth derivative of p at 0 matching with the dth derivative of f at 0. So this p matches very well with f at 0. But what happens for non-zero x's? So it is natural to ask how big is the error fx minus px when x is not equal to 0. And Taylor's formula answers this question. It tells us what this error is in terms of the d plus first derivative of f. So before we go on to see a proof of this Taylor's uh, formula and its precise statement, let's mention that this is a worthwhile question because of course the given smooth function can be fairly complicated. On the other hand, polynomials are very simple things. They are just linear combinations of power functions. So if we have a handle on how big this error can be, then in principle we could replace the complicated function f by its Taylor polynomial and we would know precisely how big the error can be when we do this replacement. So that's the importance of Taylor's formula. So without any further ado, here is the statement of Taylor's formula with integral remainder. So, so far we have been assuming that this f is infinitely many times differentiable, but now suppose that this f has derivatives up till order d plus 1 and all of these are continuous. So that's the assumption. And from this f, then we can construct its d degree Taylor polynomial given the same manner as we have previously seen. Then Taylor's formula says that the error incurred fx minus px is given by this expression, which is 1 by d factorial integral 0 to x, x minus u to the power d times the d plus first derivative of f. So the error is given in terms of an integral and the integration variable is this u and this x is the point of interest and the error is expressed in terms of the d plus first derivative of f. So before we see a proof of this Taylor's formula, let's make a few remarks. So the error is expressed in terms of this integral which involves the d plus first derivative of this f. So if we have estimates on the size of this d plus first derivative, say on some interval we know that it's in between these two numbers little m and capital M, then by substituting these two numbers over here, we would know how big the error is in that interval. And that's one way of practically using this Taylor's formula. Also, this is called Taylor's formula with integral remainder because the error is expressed in terms of an integral, but there's a different version of Taylor's formula where the error is expressed in terms of the d plus first derivative evaluated at some point. So that's the differential remainder version but this is the integral remainder version. And there is nothing special about 0 or r by which we mean that we have been assuming that this f is from r to r in our Taylor's formula, from r to r, but instead we could uh, look at this f defined on an interval of this type a minus delta to a plus delta. And over here, when constructing the Taylor polynomial, we have been taking the successive derivatives of f at 0 but there's nothing special about zero. We could instead take the derivatives at some point a, and then instead of taking powers of x or x minus zero, we now take powers of x minus a. So there's a version of Taylor's formula, namely this one, also in that situation where the zero is replaced by the a and the r is replaced by such an interval. But to begin with, we consider this sort of less tedious notational version. And although it's called Taylor's formula, after the English mathematician Brooke Taylor, there were other mathematicians who were also involved in its genesis, such as Legendre and Gregory. So before we give a proof of this Taylor's formula, let's see an application of this Taylor's formula, pure mathematical application, where we'll show these inequalities. So we'd say that for every natural number n, if we look at Euler's constant e minus this rational number, which is 1 plus 1 by 1 factorial plus 1 by 2 factorial plus 1 up to 1 by n factorial, 
then the error incurred is bounded above by this number and below by this number. And we'll prove this using Taylor's formula. But before we do that, let's uh, uh, notice that as n tends to infinity, of course, this goes to zero and also this goes to zero. So by the sandwich theorem, we know that these numbers converge to E as n tends to infinity. So we get a sequence of rational numbers which converge to E, but not only that, we also have an estimate on how big the error gets. And so in principle, we could evaluate E to three decimal places by making sure that we choose a large enough n so that this is less than say one by 10,000. So let's prove these inequalities. Um, and we'll do this by using Taylor's formula and we will apply it to the exponential function. So you might have learned about the exponential function introduced in one of several possible equivalent ways, but I'm sure that you must have learned that the exponential function has this property that its derivative is itself. And from here it follows that each kth derivative for k is non-negative is itself. And when we are finding out the Taylor's formula, uh, Taylor's polynomial, we, we will need the successive derivatives evaluated at zero. And so we should calculate this kth derivative at zero, but that's just e to the power zero and that gives one. And so for any natural number n, if we consider this nth degree Taylor polynomial, since each of these numerators fk zero is equal to one, this nth degree Taylor polynomial is just this one. And then Taylor's formula tells us that the given smooth function e to the power x minus this nth degree Taylor polynomial is given by this integral expression, which is the error. So if you put x equal to one, we get e to the power one, which is e minus this polynomial at one, which is precisely this rational number. And that is given by this error expression when x is equal to one, which is this quantity over here. So we will actually show that this red expression lies in between these two. And in this manner, we will show these inequalities. So the question is how big does this error get? And essentially it's a matter of knowing how big e to the power u gets when u is in between zero and one. But the exponential function is an increasing function because the derivative of the exponential function is e to the power x, which is always positive. And so we know that for u's in between zero and one, this e to the power u lies between e to the power zero, which is one, and e to the power one, which is e, which is furthermore less than or equal to three. So with these crude estimates that for u in between zero and one, e to the power u is less than or equal to three and bigger than or equal to one, if we substitute these numbers over here, we get the upper estimate, which is this integral and lower estimate, which is this integral. But these are easy to calculate. We can make the substitution one minus u is equal to t. And then this delivers three by n plus one. On the other hand, this gives one by n plus one. So if I divide by n factorial, this precisely gives this upper estimate of three by n plus one factorial and lower estimate of one by n plus one factorial. So e minus this rational approximant is bounded above by this and below by this as desired. And as I mentioned before, this, these are then rational approximates to E, but we also have control of the error. Not only that, these inequalities also deliver a proof of the fact that E is irrational. So let's see this. So our claim is that E is not rational. So suppose on the contrary that E is rational, in which case it can be expressed as P by Q where P and Q are natural numbers. But then we know that E minus these rational approximates is bounded above by this and below by this. And this works for all natural numbers n and E have replaced by P by Q. But now let's focus on n's which are bigger than Q and three and we'll see why soon enough. So if we multiply throughout by n factorial, then n factorial times this gives one by n plus one. n factorial times this gives three by n plus one and n factorial times whatever this quantity in between gives an integer as we shall see. So n factorial times p by q is first of all an integer by virtue of the fact that this n factorial is the product one times two times so on up till n, but somewhere in this product, q will appear as a factor because n is bigger than q. 
So that Q will cancel with this Q in the denominator delivering an integer. And on the other hand, n factorial times each of these summons gives rise to an integer. So this is an integer two. So the difference of these two is an integer. And on the one hand, it's bigger than one by n plus one, which is itself positive. And on the other hand, it's less than three by n plus one. But since n was also bigger than three, this three by n plus one is less than three fourths, which is less than one. And so we have got an integer, which is strictly bigger than zero and strictly less than one, which is a contradiction. And this contradiction shows that our original assumption was false. So E is not rational. Okay, so this we proved using these inequalities, which was in turn obtained by using Taylor's formula uh, with this exponential function. So now let's uh, actually look at a proof of Taylor's formula. And we will see a somewhat unusual proof, which is based on this article from Mathematics Magazine. But the idea behind this proof is uh, quite simple. So the key idea is we will try to reconstruct the f from its d plus first derivative by looking at this multiple integral of f d plus 1 where you have d plus 1 integrals over here. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus we know that integration and differentiation are inverse processes. So we are trying to undo the effect of this differentiation with as many integrals over here. So this will deliver Taylor's formula in the following manner. If we don't change the order of integration, then this integral yields precisely the smooth function minus its d degree Taylor polynomial. And on the other hand, if we interchange the order of integration, then this integral yields the error, which is given by Taylor's formula. And since interchange of the order of integration doesn't matter, we have that these two are the same. So that's the way we will do this. But rather than writing the proof out in full generality, we will experiment with the first few cases of d equal to 0, 1, 2, and then we'll see the picture and the proof can be completed by induction then. So let's carry out this. So let's first look at the d equal to 0 case and we will look at the integral of f prime u du from 0 to x. Now, first of all, we notice that in the d equal to zero case, this is precisely the error which is delivered by Taylor's formula. On the other hand, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that this is fx minus this constant f0, but this constant is precisely the Taylor's polynomial of this f of degree zero. And so Taylor's formula in the d equal to zero case is nothing but the fundamental theorem of calculus. But now let's look at the d equal to one case. And to this end, we will look at this double integral of f double prime. Now, if we calculate this integral directly, we'll see that this gives fx minus the Taylor polynomial of this f of degree one. And if we interchange the order of integration, then we'll see that this gives the error term. So let's see if this works out. So if we do this directly, then we notice that this inner integral by the fundamental theorem of calculus gives f prime v minus f prime zero. And using the fundamental theorem of calculus once again, this first term gives fx minus f zero. And this constant term gives f prime x times x. So you have got the smooth function minus some stuff. And this stuff is precisely the Taylor polynomial of this f of degree one. So indeed, we have got fx minus its Taylor polynomial. And now let's see if we change the order of integration if we get the error term. So here you first have integral with respect to u and then with respect to v. And for each fixed v, we are going from zero up till v. So if we interchange the order of integration, we see that for um, each fixed u, the v will have to go from u up till x. So <clears throat> this integral is given by um, also given by, by interchanging the order of integration, this inner integral will go from u up till x. And now this has nothing to do with dv, so that stays put, but then integral u to x dv gives rise to this term x minus u. So this is precisely the error term in the d equal to one case. And now we will use this d equal to one case to do the d equal to two case. And the general case is done in a similar manner by induction. So let's just focus on the d equal to two case and how we can use the d equal to one case to settle this. So as before, we look at 
the triple integral now of f triple prime and let's notice that this inner integral is a double integral of the second derivative of f prime so by the d equal to 1 case now applied to f prime this inner double integral is the smooth function which is f prime minus the Taylor polynomial of f prime of degree 1 which is this thing and this should be this du should be a dw and then we use the fundamental theorem of calculus so this f prime term gives fx minus f0 f prime 0 gives f prime 0 times x and this term gives this term so you have again got a smooth function minus some stuff and this stuff is precisely the Taylor polynomial of this f of degree 2 so as promised the direct way and using the d equal to 1 case we get the smooth function minus its Taylor polynomial of degree 2 and now let's interchange the order of integration and see if we get the error term so again this inner double integral we use the d equal to 1 case applied to f prime and that gives the error term for that which is this expression and now we again change the order of integration so we'll first do dw and then du but then this inner limits become from u to x and again this f triple prime u has nothing to do with this variable of integration so that stays the same but then the integral from u to x of w minus u dw gives x minus u square by 2 so we have indeed got the error term so just as we use the d equal to 1 case to settle the d equal to 2 case we can prove Taylor's formula in the in general by induction so this completes the proof of Taylor's formula it's a somewhat unusual proof but the traditional proofs of Taylor's formula uh, can be found in most calculus books and in particular they can be found in my calculus book called the how and why of one variable calculus which was published by Wiley in 2015 and this contains a traditional proof of Taylor's formula not just for the integral remainder version but also the differential version where the error is expressed in terms of the d plus first derivative evaluated at some point in between a and x.